Attorney Bill Newman is a longtime Western Massachusetts representative for the American Civil Liberties Union. He's also a radio host and writer. Recently, a collection of his works have been compiled and published in a book titled, When the War Came Home. Recently, Bill Newman visited us to talk about his book and a lot more. The book was really a found book, and I owe this in significant measure to Larry Parnas, who's the editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. And Larry said to me some years ago, he said, would you like to have your column back? Because I hadn't written for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, maybe. And I went back and read the columns that I had written between 10 and 20 years before. And the purpose of that was because enough time had gone by, I thought I could tell myself, well, that really stunk, or I didn't like that, or who, how to, who and how to ever publish that. But I read these, and it seemed to me that I could have written close to half of them yesterday. And so the question for me became not what worked, but why it continued to work, and the question, in essence, what lasts? And what I found was that those columns had as their lodestar the anti-Vietnam War and the movement and the ethos of that time. And then there were some other magazine pieces and other pieces I'd written during that time. And I looked at this and I said, there's a story here. And there is a book that I can put together that has an arc. And I think that's, oh, I know, that's how it came about. And I hope that's what comes through in the book. When the war came home, you go back to the Kent State shootings, May of 1970, was the time when the Vietnam War expanded into Cambodia, or at least we got word of expanding into Cambodia. There was a national student strike. That, those, those were seminal events for you. They were, because we had said, you know, these, these war makers, they could turn the war at home, they could turn the weapons on us, they could turn them on students, and frankly, I didn't really believe that. I thought it was possible, but there it was, three hours up the road from where I was in college at Antioch and at Kent State, the National Guard had opened fire on peaceful protesters and killed four students and injured nine others. And that war, which we said they could bring home, had come home. And that was a seminal event for me because it changed my perspective about what my government might do to those who would protest against its policies. And, and I think, if I'm not reading too much in, you, you begin the book talking about 1968, hating seeing people locked in cages. You were working as a student with the court system, and it was New York City where, was, where you yes. grew up at that time. A couple of years later, Kent State. Th this really formed and, and directed you career-wise to a good de degree, didn't it? It did. It did. Because, look, I was a college student. I hadn't seen people in cages. I hadn't seen people in jail. I hadn't seen how the system worked. And there I was in the Manhattan criminal courts seeing hundreds of people day being, a day being brought into the system and then brought back into the system with no hope except for this little sliver of sunshine, which was the Manhattan Court Employment Project, this experimental rehabilitation diversion program. You write a couple of times in the book about your opposition to the death penalty. And the question you say that always comes up for a death penalty defendant's attorney, will you go to the execution? That's heavy stuff. When I was doing a death penalty case in Georgia, it was the question that first came to my mind. And I was afraid to ask it of the attorney I was working with, who was Brian Stevenson, who of course has written this exquisite new book that has gotten rave reviews and should. And Brian was a young attorney at the time, and I asked him, and I thought it might be a very peculiar question. He said, not to worry, every northern lawyer who comes down here and volunteers to work on death cases asks that question. And the question actually has its own answer, which is after spending years with someone trying to save their life, should you fail at that endeavor, of course you don't have to go. And of course, you would. Still thinking about executions, there, there's a very moving piece in the book, Robbie's parents. Robbie being Robert Mirapol, son of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They were executed in the 1950s, convicted as spies, uh, found guilty of giving information to the Soviets, information that helped the Russians develop the atomic bomb. Y you make a strong case in your piece, especially for Mrs. Rosenberg, Ethel Rosenberg that there just wasn't any 
evidence connecting her to the alleged crimes of her husband and certainly not to lead to her execution. The Rosenberg case is, of course, a matter of great historical significance, and Robbie Mirapol is a friend of mine. And what I try to point out in that piece, among other things, because it's a personal piece as well, talking about Robbie, but the government did never, never actually convicted or actually even charged the Rosenbergs mm -hmm. with those crimes that you just described, as it's often described. Mm -hmm. The government charged them with conspiracy right. to engage in those crimes. And so they actually never proved a substantive crime. The charge was conspiracy. And what the historical record shows is that Julius Rosenberg, in all probability, was a spy for the Soviet Union during World War II, but he had nothing to do with the secrets of the atomic bomb. He was innocent of that, and Ethel Rosenberg had nothing to do with any of it. And you can tell this from the questions of the attorney general who, after they were convicted, had as questions when they thought they were actually going to talk because they were facing execution. The first question to Ethel Rosenberg was, did you actually know anything about what your husband was doing? The government knew she had nothing to do with it. It was a frame-up. It was, it is, and it remains one of the really sad and, I think, horrific moments in American history where the government took political took political umbrage at two people, decided to use them as ex an example, and then murdered them, killed them in cold blood, knowing they were innocent, and beyond all doubt, knowing that Ethel Rosenberg was completely innocent. Let's, let's shift gears. Let, let's talk about something that's been in the news a lot the last six, eight months or so, police shootings, especially white police shootings of young men of color, black men, Latino men, we talked when we were planning this interview, and you talked about the need you see really across the country, every community in this country, every place there's a police force to have a significant effort put into improving police community relations. You say that is, that is just an area that is just sorely lacking in your estimation. I, I think that's true. And I think that community policing is important. I think it's not a question of a Band-Aid, though. We're talking about institutional racism. And police forces, of course, reflect the society at large. And because they have such enormous power, I think that the issues of power and powerlessness are exacerbated in those relationships. There needs to be oversight. There needs to be training. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be, in a police force, people who will say, no, this kind of behavior is intolerable. We don't beat up people. We don't shoot up, shoot people who, who, who do not need to be shot. And we don't need to be violent. We need to have a police force that is professional. And I think in communities across the United States, those fundamental precepts are lost. Bill Newman, the, the book is fascinating. Your work is fascinating. It's when the war came home. We barely scratched the surface. We appreciate your time with us, sir. Thanks I, for coming I'm in. I'm grateful you had me. Thanks so very much.